Okay, great. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this final session on shared memory programming with OpenMP. So today I'm not going to teach you any new OpenMP syntax. So what you've got already, what, what we've taught you already um, is certainly enough to get you going and probably enough to keep you going for quite a large number of OpenMP applications. So if you, uh, you know, so we've got parallel regions, we've got work sharing constructs, we know how to deal with shared and private data, we know about the synchronization constructs, um, so that will get, that will typically get you a, a long way for most OpenMP applications. Um, OpenMP now is, the standard is now quite big. Um, there is a lot of other stuff in there, um, but uh, what I've covered is the core content, which will give you a very good start. So what I wanted to do today is, um, first of all, I'm going to cover a, a bunch of basically small things, but important things, which hopefully will make you um, better and more productive OpenMP programmers and uh, help you avoid falling into um, a number of, of, uh, of nasty little traps, which tend, to, uh, which tend to catch people out when they're starting with OpenMP. Um, so that's the first session, uh, and then in the, the final session, I'm going to talk about performance issues, because o OpenMP is, a, is an API where it's relatively easy to get a parallel code working, um, but getting it working efficiently and tuning the performance can be quite tricky and difficult. Um, so, I'm, so that's what I'm going to cover in, in the final session today. Okay, as ever, please, if you have questions as we go along, um, type them in in the chat window and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them as we go. Okay, so tips, tricks, and gotchas. Okay, first up, um, OpenMP directives. So. Unfortunately, because you know, what, one nasty side effect of the way uh, OpenMP directives are constructed is that mistyping the sentinel. So if you type in Fortran exclamation OMP instead of exclamation mark dollar OMP, or you type hash pragma OPM instead of hash pragma OMP in C or C++, the compiler will not spot that. Uh, it will raise no error message, and it will simply uh, that you will simply ignore the directive that you have in there. So that means be careful. Um, most of the time, the consequences are that you just simply won't get any parallelism. You'll just get sequential execution when you thought you were when you thought you had a parallel region or a parallel loop. Um, but there are some nasty cases. So, for example, for an, if you mistype an atomic directive, then the compiler will simply ignore the directive and you are left with a race condition in your program, So, which is pretty, um, pretty unpleasant. So just be aware of that. Um, if, you, if, like me, you know that you are prone to certain typos, then it's perhaps worth writing yourself a little script just to search your code for, for the ones that you are, if you know you're prone to making them. Okay. Um, so, as we mentioned before, the way the directives are designed, it's designed to help you write code that works without OpenMP as well as with it. Um, so uh, another feature that helps you do that is, uh, as well as the ability for the compiler to ignore the directives, 
we also need to be able to take care of uh, what happens if we call li uh, runtime library routines. Um, so you can do this with conditional compilation. So uh, the macro underscore OpenMP is defined if the code has been compiled with the OpenMP switch on. So you can use that as a portable way so this will work with any compiler. You can use that to portably, conditionally compile code so that it works with and without OpenMP enabled. So you can have you know, um, conditional compilation, so like hash if def underscore OpenMP, uh, and that code will be compiled if your compiler, if you compiled with the OpenMP switch on, and it'll be, uh, and it, it'll be ignored if you don't. So that's a portable way of doing it. Um, there is an alternative to that. You could you could consider linking dummy OpenMP library routines into your sequential code. So a version of the OpenMP library that just did sen return sensible values for uh, for a single for sequential execution. Um, but uh, and there's there's code in the standard you can you can copy, but um, that's probably a less a less attractive option as con than conditional compilation. Okay, so um, this next one is actually straying a little bit uh, into performance issues. Um, but just so that you're aware of the, the, the uh, general magnitude of, of, uh, of overheads. So the overhead of executing a parallel region is typically in the sort of tens of microseconds range. So it does depend on the compiler that you're using. It depends on the hardware that you're running on. It depends on how many threads you're running, but it's that sort of order of magnitude. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, it means that if the uh, sequential execution time of a, of a section of a code uh, isn't of that order, so it really has to be several times that in order to make it worth parallelizing. Um, so if you know if you're if you're trying to parallelize a section of code that, that executes for less than uh, less than a few microseconds, then you're basically going to be out of luck because the overheads of parallelizing it will outweigh any potential gain you get from the actual parallel execution. So. One situation you can run into is that you have the the same piece of code um, can take different amounts of time to execute depending on the instance. So you know, a, piece, a block of code may be executed many, many times. Sometimes there's a lot of work in it, which is worth parallelizing it, and sometimes there isn't. Um, you can use the if clause. So the, uh, the parallel directive takes an if clause so you can um, basically do a runtime test to see whether to go to go parallel or not um, you are still taking some uh, overhead for for having a parallel region on one thread but it's typically much smaller so that's typically much less than a microsecond so you know kind of order of a maybe a tenth of a microsecond so the overhead of uh, overhead of a parallel region on one thread is a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than than the overhead on on multiple threads. Um, okay, and um, something that I've uh, worked on um, uh, for for a long time is a set of micro benchmarks, which uh, which allow you to do detailed measurements on your system. So it measures these little benchmarks. They measure things like you know, how, what, what's, what is the cost of a parallel region? What's the cost of a parallel loop? What's the cost of entering and exiting a critical section, for example? So if you're interested in, in measuring these things on your, on your system uh, or for a particular compiler, then you can, you're very welcome to use those. OK. So next up, okay, so you can often face the question, particularly if it's, uh, you know, if you're dealing with code that you didn't write um, and you say, okay, um, I've got a loop here, um, uh, but I'm not sure whether it's parallelizable because I don't know whether there are any cross iteration dependencies. 
Um, so a very, a very quick and dirty test for whether this is going to work is to run, run the, the loop in reverse order. Okay, uh, it's not totally infallible, but it's quite hard to, to, uh, to construct a counterexample where running the loop backwards will give you the same answer as running the loop forwards, um, but uh, still not have dependencies in it. Um, so, yeah, that's a quick, quick test. Um, of course, all that tells you is whether whether there are dependencies in your loop. Um, you are still, nevertheless, faced with the the problem of dealing with all the uh, shared and private variables correctly. Okay, so it doesn't, you know, it, it it tells you something about the dependencies. It doesn't tell you how to how to parallelize the loop in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, identifying shared and private variables. So I mentioned at some point that I didn't I did uh, I don't think I explained the syntax um, is that it's possible if you are certain that you don't need the barrier synchronization at the end of a work sharing loop then it's possible to suppress that barrier uh, and the way that's done you can see there and this is a C example here you can see that the uh, the first loop directive has a no wait clause on the end of it. Um, and so what that does is that suppresses the barrier synchronization at the end of that loop. Uh, if you want to do it in Fortran, uh, the no wait goes on the end do. You need an you, you and that's the case where you actually do need the end do directive. So in Fortran, it, you'd have a, a a do directive and then end do no wait on the end. Okay, but one question that might arise this is quite a common situation is say, okay, um, is this kind of situation in this kind of situation is it safe to suppress the barrier? Okay. So the first loop here writes, uh, loops over I and writes values into AI, and the second loop reads AI. So is it safe to suppress that barrier? Uh, and the answer is yes, provided the conditions are met. So long as the number of loop iterations is the same, and the schedules are the same, uh, and they're static or static with a chunk size, then this is safe to do because you are guaranteed to get the same mapping of iterations to threads. So what that means is that for ve every element of A, you are guaranteed that the same thread will write AI in the first loop and then read it in the second one, so you are guaranteed that you don't have any uh, dependencies, across thread dependencies here uh, and no, no race conditions. If we're going to be really pedantic, in fact, the default schedule for loops with no schedule clause isn't actually static, it's implementation defined. Um, in practice, though, uh, it does always default to static. Um, should, this is perhaps being a little bit over pedantic that you shouldn't necessarily rely on, rely on that. Okay, I think it's, uh, you're going to be very unlucky if you uh, get caught out by a compiler that doesn't use static as the, as the, as the schedule for for loops without without a without a schedule course. Um, one thing that you will find again, this is kind of a little bit straying into performance issues, but you will find that if you have an unbalanced loop, then you know whether you are you are often faced with trying to choose a good chunk size for static or dynamic schedules. 
Um, so, you know, you have an unbalanced loop, you say, okay, let's, let's try static with a chunk size or dynamic with a chunk size. Uh, and then you're faced with the problem of choosing an optimal chunk size value. Okay. Um, the problem here is that the optimal chunk size can depend quite strongly on the number of threads. But you want to write code that's independent of the number of threads. So one way around this is that it's often more robust. Instead of choose, choosing chunk size directly, the parameter that you tune is the number of chunks per thread. So how many chunks is each thread going to execute? So if you have that as a parameter, you can then, uh, and you at runtime, you know the number of threads, you know the number of iterations in the loop ahead of time. So you can then derive the chunk size from that because the chunk size expression, so what actually appears is in the, uh, in, in the schedule clause, that does not have to be a compile time constant. That can be a runtime evaluated expression. So that's uh, that's a that's a useful trick to make your uh, make your tuning chunk sizes more robust across the thread numbers. So as we saw in an earlier session, there are essentially these two different ways where you can have, if you want, uh, if you're inside a parallel region and you want a block of code to be executed by one thread only, then you have this choice of whether to use single or master. Um, so which one should you use? Well, uh, essentially master has lower overhead because um, it's just a simple test on the thread whereas single requires some synchronization so, uh, in order for the threads to agree which one got there first. Um, but then just remember that master has no implied barrier. So if you need a barrier after, if you need a barrier after this block of code, if you use master, then you have to code an explicit barrier at the end. On the other hand, if, you, if there are reasons, you know, if there are good reasons why you expect some threads to arrive at this block of code before others, uh, which means you can potentially overlap the execution of the block with stuff that's going on in, in other threads, then it's probably better to use single. So that the, so whichever thread arrives at the block first can get on with it and the other, other threads may still be executing something else at the same time. So a word or two about data sharing attributes. Um, yeah, don't forget that private variables are uninitialized on entry to parallel regions. That's quite a common source of bugs. And it will it will cause your code. It can cause your code to fail, even if you run on one thread, because even if you have a parallel region on one thread with a private with a, a variable that, that appears in a private clause, you still get a private uninitialized copy of that thing. So remember that there is, you know, there is the, the option of first private if you want to initialize private variables with the value that the master thread had when it encountered the, the parallel region, but it's it's more likely just to be a mistake, okay? Because the use cases for first private are, are actually surprisingly rare. Probably just means that you forgot to uh, to assign something to those private variables inside the, on every thread here inside the parallel region. Um, so I mentioned this before, but I think it's so important that I don't mind repeating myself here. Uh, and this is the uh, this issue that uh, essentially, if you don't use a default clause, then 
what you get is the same behavior as is, as if you specified default shared. Um, uh, and this is extremely dangerous. Um, it, it just makes it far too easy to accidentally share variables. Um, and as I think I mentioned before, I think this is possibly the worst design design decision in the history of OpenMP. Okay, I think it was a really poor, with hindsight, this was a really poor choice. Um, so always, always make yourself use default none and explicitly list all the variables that appear inside your parallel region in either uh, private, shared, first private, or reduction clauses. Um, and even if you, even if, even if your code looks looks really simple, doesn't have any and many variables in it, I guarantee that if you don't do this, it will bite you or later. Okay. The reason for this is that something that I've seen. Um, just watching people, I've you know, watched a lot of students over the years uh, learning to code in, in OpenMP. And the problem here is that every, everybody suffers from what I call variable blindness. If you ask somebody to list all the variables that appear in a block of code, then that's surprisingly difficult. And these people tend just to just to to uh, gloss over some of them and ignore them. So it's all too easy. I mean, what that means is that it's all too easy just to glance at a piece of code and say, "Oh, okay, I've you know, and see what all the private variables are there." So I'll just use default shared, and and those are the private variables, and 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 I'm done. Um, but it's just too easy to to miss something. Uh, and end up with some uh, end up with something that uh, should be private sh is shared by default and and you get a race condition. Okay. Um, so here's an example um, where it's quite it's quite hard okay to to spot the problem. So the issue in this piece of code is that. The, uh, this is okay. So it's um, it's slightly old-fashioned C, um, but because the loop iterator J is not declared inside the scope of the loop, okay. So I don't have int J in my in my loop statement here. Uh, the loop iterator J will be shared by default. Um, which is a bug, uh, and it's quite hard to spot. And you know, I is fine because I is the parallel loop iterator. So the, the the iterator of the parallelized loop is always privatized by default. But but in this case, J is not. Um, so and even worse is that if you compiled this code with sufficient optimization, then you may always get the right answer because the compile, in fact, eliminates any loads and stores of J. So the value of J will never actually be stored in memory anywhere. However, you know, one day, you know, so you write this code, you test it to death, you never see a problem, but then, you know, you will you go to somebody else or you release it. And then somebody else compiles it with no optimization in the compiler, and all of a sudden you have broken code. Okay, so this is this is the kind of problem where you know, and it's not just true for loop iterations. You know, sort of other other loop temporary variables might have might have a similar similar kind of problem here. Um, so yeah. It's bad, and this can be this kind of problem can largely be avoided by always using default none, because uh, what you will get is a is, is a compile time failure, and the compile compilation will fail, and most compilers are pretty good at telling you, uh, you know, list giving you say you know um, this 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 variable 
um, was did not appear in, in any of the data attribute sharing clauses on this parallel region. So the the compile error messages are usually pretty pretty helpful here. Um, I've uh, so another interesting problem that you can get with this kind of thing is that you can also end up in the situation where you have a race. You you may have a race condition that always produces the correct answer. <laughs> so that sounds like a weird thing, but you can have a you can have a variable where every thread assigns the same value to it. So having a shared copy will never get the wrong answer. But you will get horrible performance because the cache behavior is terrible. And I've seen an instance of that very recently in a, in a commercial code. Okay, so the authors hadn't used default none. They implicitly left uh, you know, variables as being shared. There were uh, half a dozen variables or, or which were basically being uh, assigned the same value by, by every thread um, on every loop iteration. And although you know, there was no problem, the, the code always got the correct answers, never broke, but the performance was awful. Uh, and by, by fixing that, um, you know, we'd be able to see about a five times improvement in, in performance. So there are many reasons for it. Okay, so hopefully I've um, I've convinced you that, that that this is a really good idea, and will 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 save you a whole bunch of pain in the long run, even though it involves a bit more typing in in the short term. Okay. Okay, this is a nasty little feature, uh, which is to do with with global variables. Um, so, example. Let me talk through this example a little bit here. Okay. So, uh, so I have some uh, some global variable called foo here. So, it's, which is declared at file scope, okay. and then I have a parallel region where I declare foo in a private clause, so that I have private copies uh, inside the parallel region. I have private copies of foo down here, okay? But then also inside the parallel region, I have make a function call. And this, inside the function, there are also references to foo, okay? Because it's, you know, it's accessed from inside the function as a, as a global variable. So the question then arises, okay, what, if I'm inside this function, which copy of foo does that refer to? Okay, does this in fact refer to the original storage in the in the global variable, or does it refer to the private copies that were created for each thread at the start of the parallel region? Um, and unfortunately, the answer is you don't know. It's unspecified which which thing that's going to refer to. Um, it'll be one or the other, but you don't know which. And different compilers may vary in their behavior. So this kind of code is unportable uh, and therefore pretty much unusable. So although you may get, you know, you can, uh, you may get one particular behavior for one compiler, um, it's, you need to be very careful doing this kind of thing because if you then run, you compile your code with a different compiler, you may get the wrong behavior. So essentially, this is again, don't do this. If you want to access the private copy, um, you know, pass it through the argument list. Okay. Make it explicit. Okay. Um, or the other way around this is, is this is a case where you might, if if you want, if you re, if you Another way around this is to is to make thread private copies of this thing. Okay, so use the thread private clause on foo so that you get a uh, you get thread private copies of the global variable rather than temporary 
private copies for every thread for the duration of the parallel region. So this kind of problem crops up if you are un typically if you are unlucky enough to inherit some old-fashioned piece of Fortran. Um, so it can happen. Can also happen with C codes as well, but it's it's, it's a bit less common. Um, so you know what you are what you are what you are faced with is you know is a loop which contains several pages of code, um, you know, hundreds of lines of code maybe inside the loop without any function calls or any modularization and making reference to hundreds of variables. So then if you want to parallelize this loop with OpenMP, you are faced with the problem of determining whether all those variables are private or shared or reductions. Um, and you know, that's tedious and error prone and, and difficult to test adequately because, uh, say, all these reasons, you might have a, a race condition that's rarely triggered, you might have a race condition that's, um, that gives you the right answers but is, is bad for performance, you might have a race condition that only appears uh, when you have low levels of compiler optimization and disappears when you have have high levels. So there's all sorts of reasons why testing this kind of thing is hard. So the uh, you know the, the the trick here is to refactor the sequential code. Okay, um, to take the take all that big uh, that huge loop body and wrap it up inside a subroutine call. And then what you can do is make all the the loop temporary variables local variable uh, can then become local variables and declared inside the subroutine. And and only the other things, um, only the shared and reduction variables get passed through the argument list. Um, so why does that help? It's because that's that's a sequential change. That's a change to the sequential code. So it's much easier to test to see whether you've got that right or not. Um, uh, so once you've done that, then hopefully you have a lot fewer variables which are in scope at the parallel region. And you've already thought about, you, you've already been forced to think about how they're used so you have a much better a better chance of getting the the data attribute scoping right for them. Okay. Um, C and C plus programmers, the you say you don't often find this sort of problem so often, uh, and in in that case, it's, in any way, it's always possible there to declare your temporaries in the scope of the loop body anyway. So you may not need to do this uh, need to do this refactoring in any case. So I mentioned that it's uh, it can be quite useful to be able to do reductions on work sharing loops, um, and the reason is that you can um, you can end up in situations like this. Okay, so you have a parallel region, and you have a loop which involves some reduction operation, so forming the sum of a uh, of an array here canonical example and but then you actually want to use the result of that reduction operation later on inside the parallel region so it means that i can't put the reduction clause on the parallel region because then it's too late okay. so i need the result inside the parallel region so the reduction clause has to go on on the loop um, so that means that I need, okay, so I need to initialize this variable somewhere. Okay, so that's done here. 
uh, and that's in fact incorrect. Okay, and that's really not obvious to spot. Okay, in fact, I have a race condition here. I have a hidden race condition okay? because um, some at the on the parallel region, I have to declare some as a shared variable. Okay. And then what I have here is a race because, in fact, every thread at this point here is setting the value of sum to zero. Now, at first glance, that looks harmless. But in fact, it isn't because what can happen is that one thread, if one thread gets ahead, okay, remember they're executing asynchronously here. So, you know, for, for, for various reasons, threads can be arbitrarily delayed at any point. So one thread might get ahead here. It might get all the way through its loop iterations, uh, add its partial sum into the original storage here, and then later on, another thread comes and resets it back to zero again. So you can actually lose some threads partial sums by doing this. So yeah, so this is, this is, a, this is an, uh, a bug uh, and it's not, it's not that obvious to spot. Uh, it looks, looks totally harmless, but it isn't. So how do you fix that? Well, a couple of options here. In this case, um, it would it uh, it would be possible to move uh, the initialization of sum outside the parallel region, um, but that's not always possible. You might have uh, you might have a loop inside the you might have a sequential loop inside the parallel region, and you might need to reset this value on every iteration. So the other the only the only really safe way of doing that is to put that put this in a uh, in a single or in a master region with a barrier, okay? So that only one thread does the initialization of sum, and then there's a barrier synchronization before any of the, any of the loop iterations start, and uh, that avoids the, the, the potential race here. So something very, very nasty might happen to you if you decide, okay, uh, I have a sequential code here. I'm planning it to convert it to OpenMP. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll just change the compiler flags. Okay. So you didn't touch your code at all. It's the original sequential code. You compiled it with the OpenMP flag on and your code broke. Okay. It crashed. So you think, well, what on earth happened there? I didn't even change the code. I just compiled it differently, and it didn't even work. Okay. Maybe this, maybe this OpenMP thing is 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 all a bit dangerous and nasty and flaky. Okay, um, a couple of possibilities here. Um, you might have a bug in your code. Okay, which is assuming that the contents of a local variable uh, is, are preserved between function calls. So in other words, you have a missing, uh, so in Fortran you have a missing save statement. Uh, in C or C++ you have a missing static keyword. And the reason your code breaks is that compiling with, open M, with the OpenMP flag on forces all your local variables to be stack allocated and not heap allocated. Um, that's so that the privatization rules get obeyed. So the compiler makes sure that the privatization rules about local variables uh, get obeyed correctly. Okay. So without the OpenMP flag, the compiler often has a choice. You know, particularly for arrays, it can choose to heap allocate them instead of instead of stack allocate them. Um, but Okay, compiling with OpenMP forces stack allocation. And say, if you have a missing save or static, that might break your code. The other thing it can do is if you have uh, significantly large arrays or other data structures, which are local to 
uh, local to functions, then you also, that might get you into Stack Overflow problems. Okay. So just compiling with OpenMP can increase the amount of stack space required for your program. Uh, and if you're if you run out of stack stack space, then well, usually what you get is a uh, a horrible death. Usually, usually a segmentation fault. So you do need to make sure that you are using, say, if you do have this property where you're expecting values to be preserved across calls, then you do need to use save or static correctly. Um, but that might just uncover more problems because if you do that, then you have to realize that those variables are then shared by default. So you might then need to declare them as thread private. Um, and in particular, you might need to do something about um, you know, one, one common use case for this feature is, is first time through code. Okay? So you have a flag inside your function, which is, uh, which is initially, set, uh, initially set to true. And the first time the function is called and you execute some code, uh, and then you set the flag to false so that the uh, so that, that block of code is never called again. Um, if your first if that if the first time if the first call is going to appear inside a parallel region, then you've got a problem because um, you've then your potential race you've got you know, your multiple threads potentially trying to execute this first time through code. So you either need to uh, think about, think care, very carefully how you're going to synchronize that correctly, um, or do something else. So refactor your code so that that one time through thing gets done before you ever go into a parallel region. So if you do end up having, so it brings us on to stack sizes. So if you do have large bit data structures, it's you know, and those might be just local, um, local arrays inside functions which are called inside parallel regions. So it, it's possible to run out of stack space. And the way that stack space is controlled for OpenMP programs is slightly messy. Okay. So the way it works is that the size of the thread stack, apart from the master thread, so every thread other than the master thread you can control it with an environment variable called OMP underscore stack size. However, that doesn't control the size of the master thread stack. That's controlled in whatever, this, whatever mechanism you would normally use for a sequential program. So depending on the compiler and the operating system, that might be a compiler switch or it might be using a, a command. So for Linux, for example, you would use the you might use the ulimit command to uh, to set the stack size for for subsequent processes. Okay. So the reason is it's messy like this is that there's no way that OpenMP can control the master thread stack size. Um, it's basically because stack size is 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 set at process creation time and it's too late. The OpenMP runtime is, uh, cannot get invoked early enough in the, uh, in the process creation to, to actually affect the stack size of the master thread. Okay. Um, yep, okay, a little bit about synchronization. So you, you can't protect updates to shared variables in one place with atomic and another place with critical. If you if they might interact, okay, if they might contend, um, so there's no mutual exclusion between these. Okay. So you can't have a parallel region where you have, you know, you have updates to shared variables in different places. You can't protect one of the updates with a critical and another with an atomic, uh, and expect that to mutually exclude properly. Okay. So little trick here. Okay. Uh, sometimes you may wish to uh, allocate some storage based on the number of threads. Okay. 
so you might want to create you might want to say you know you might want to create an, ar an array with the, with the same number of elements as you're going to have threads in a, in a parallel region okay. um, but the problem is how do you know how many threads the next parallel region is going to use you can't call OMP get num threads because from from the master thread because that that will always return one um, what you can do is you can call a different function, which is OMP get max threads. So what that does is returns the value of a thing called the n threads var uh, internal control variable. Um, so OpenMP has this notion of some hidden internal state, which uh, which controls the behavior of things like uh, how many threads you have in a parallel region, uh, and and there are others as well. Um, so you can basically query this internal value with OMP get max threads. So, and what you're guaranteed is that, none, is that the number of threads used for the next parallel region will not exceed this uh, unless you put an explicit num threads clause on the parallel region. Okay. Um, implementation always has some freedom to deliver fewer threads than what you ask for. Okay, so if you um, if you do write code that actually depends on there being a certain number of threads inside a parallel region, to make that properly safe, you should always check. Okay, um, so if you you know if your code won't work uh, uh, unless you have say m you know more than two threads in the parallel region, um, and it's it's possible to write code that that that's like that, um, then uh, if you want to make that code robust, you should always check, okay? Um, and take some suitable avoiding action if you got fewer threads than what you were expecting. Okay, so again, straying a little bit into performance issues. Um, there are a bunch of environment variables that control the way that that threads behave, um, and which affect don't affect the the way the code ex what the code executes, but they they can affect the performance. Okay, so uh, if you want to maximize performance, then uh, there are some things that you should set, and you can't rely on the defaults being set correctly for these. Um, Different compilers take different attitudes towards um, this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, so there's basically three of them. Uh, you set OMP weight policy equals active. Um, so what that does is that it encourages idle threads to spin and consume CPU cycles in, uh, when when they're not doing anything. Okay, so for example, if they're waiting at a barrier, or they're between, you know, you've got threads where uh, between parallel regions where threads would be idle, then it's um, it's faster to reawaken them if they're already alive, rather than putting to sleep, putting them to sleep and waking them up again. So it means that your idle threads are are consuming CPU cycles. Um, that's, uh, but that's usually not a problem. Um, it might be potentially less of a good idea um, on some modern processors where you have turbo clocking, okay? Because doing this to um, having threads spinning when they're idle may prevent the system from boosting the clock rate for the core where the master thread is running. So you have to be possibly, depending on your, uh, you know, if you do have long gaps between parallel regions, then this might ne not necessarily be the best idea on some, some modern processors. The second one is OMP dynamic. So this is nothing to do with the dynamic in the uh, schedule, in the loop scheduling. What this does is it basically says, if you set OMP dynamic equals false, then 
well, it doesn't really guarantee it, but it's a hint to the runtime to say, you know, don't deliver fewer threads than, than you asked for. If you set OMP dynamic equals true, then what you're basically saying is the runtime is in, then in, encouraged to look at the load on the system and based on the load on your hardware, then choose the number of threads to execute a parallel region based on the current re the current uh, CPU utilization on your system. Um, so that may end up you delivering you fewer threads than what you asked for. So if but if you don't care about anything else that's running, you just want the performance for your application, you should set OMP dynamic equals false. And the third one is OMP proc bind equals true. So what that does is that it encourages the runtime to bind your threads to physical cores and prevent them migrating, prevent the operating system from uh, deciding to move threads between cores while your application is running. Um, because generally speaking, that's, that's bad for performance. Okay. So um, you may, of course, find at some point that you have shock horror, a bug in your OpenMP code. Um, so depending on what system you're using, so you know traditional debuggers like you know, DDT or TotalView, which you, you know, find quite commonly on HPC systems, or um, the debuggers that are built into development environments, things like Visual Studio or other. Uh, or Eclipse or whatever, um, you know, typically do have support for OpenMP or, and multi-threaded programming in general. You know, so they allow you to, you know, to control threads, to step threads, and you know, switch between threads when you're at a breakpoint and all this kind of stuff. And that's great, um, but this kind of tool, uh, so traditional debuggers are are pretty much useless for trying to track down race conditions because what happens is that running under the debugger changes the timing of events on, on different threads. Um, so, you know, it's just simply the act of, of executing your code inside a debugger may often just make the race condition go away. So that's, that's not much help. Um, there are some tools that do attempt to do race detection, but they work in a very different way. Okay, so they're not like traditional debugging tools. Um, what they do is that you they uh, they let they instrument your code, uh, and then they capture a trace of all the memory accesses that happened during a run of your code, uh, and then they do some analysis on that trace. Uh, to look for races, you know, for uh, conflicting accesses to shared variables that might have occurred, um, but didn't necessarily actually happen during that execution. Okay. Um, so there's a couple here. So I think the um, you won't find the Oracle one around anymore. I think that's now now defunct. Um, but uh, Intel make a tool. So Intel Inspector, or in, I think it's called Inspector XE these days. Um, is, is, is a useful tool that, uh, that allows you to do some race condition detection. Um, it's not too bad. It's, you know, these type of tools uh, occasionally will throw up um, false positives. So they will, they will uh, point, you know, they will throw up a problem which doesn't really exist. Um, and you have to be, uh, you have to essentially maybe uh, take a bit of care about uh, what sort of length of run you do because the trace files can get very big, uh, and in which case the tool will probably just just grind to a halt and will fall over. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So if we're interested in performance, then probably you want to time your code or time sections of your code. Um, so, but the crucial thing here is to make sure that your timer really does actually measure wall clock time. Okay, so you know, do use OMP get W time. OpenMP's built-in timer 
because that does what it says. Okay, that really is war clock time. Um, uh, other timers, okay, so like uh, the Linux clock routine, for example, is quite a popular um, for, to, for people to use as a, as a timer. Um, but what that measures is not wall clock time. It's the CPU time. And that CPU time is accumulated across all the threads that are running. Okay. So what you usually see is if you measure with this, then you never see any speed up. Okay. Um, adding threads just increases the accumulated ball, uh, CPU time. Um, so you never apparently see any, you, you know, no wonder you don't see any speed up. Um, if you, if you, if that's it, but if you, if you're expecting it to return a war clock time, which it doesn't. Um, so that's, that's a, that's quite a common gotcha with, with, with timers. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the end of this session. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, a couple of questions coming in here. Um, do I have any experience with thread sanitizer from Google? Um, no, I don't. Um, but yeah, that's uh, potentially another one of these tools which does this kind of thing. Yeah. And the question in the reduction race trap example is. Is the initializer of some by itself? It's already a data race. Yes, technically speaking, that is a race because um, it's um, it's one of these. Uh, it's yeah. You know, it's every thread. Technically, that is a race. Every thread is uh, is writing to a shared variable with no synchronization. Um, but it's one of those races that you can you know you can think might be harmless because every thread is writing the same value. Um, but it's not okay. Um, so yeah, but even these, uh, even these harmless-looking races. So in this case, it's not harmless. Um, but even this kind of thing out the reduction trap um, is potentially a performance bug um, rather than a correctness bug. Okay, parallel code requires random number generation. What's the best way to ensure each thread has independent random generators with different seeds? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, big topic, tricky. Um, um, so um, you have to be really careful about this kind of thing. Um, it depends a lot on how much you care about the quality of your random number generation. Okay. Um, so the really, really safe method is to use one of these fam is to use one of the types of random generator where you actually have a whole family of random number generators, which have which so and the different instances uh, use different internal constants. So not just different seeds, they really have um, different uh, like um, offset values internally. Um, so the really, really safe thing to do is to use one of those family, uh, those uh, random number generator family and use a different instance, completely different instance uh, on every thread. Um, otherwise, you it depends on the library. Okay, it depends whether your random gener number generator is thread safe or not. Um, a lot of them aren't, um, and again, it depends uh, on your use case. So, if your random gem number generation is not performance critical then it may make sense just to do that sequentially and store them somewhere. Um, on the other hand, you might have um, performance, it might be performance critical, okay? You might not be able to afford to do that, say, in which case you have to have to look at one of the other solutions. But yeah, ran, random, random number, gen, parallel random number generation is a big topic in, it, in itself. 
uh, and it does depend a bit on how um, how sensitive your application is because even with you know you can run into this problem is even if threads have different seeds then you're basically it's hard to guarantee that uh, parts of uh, parts of the sequence on different threads will not overlap at some point, which uh, for some applications is fine. For other applications, that's that would be total disaster. Oh, spotted a bug in my code. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay, a course on OpenMP tasking. Um, so I do cover that in some of our uh, live courses. I uh, haven't done it in. We haven't haven't run that as an as an as an online one. Um, yeah, but if you um, if you're interested, if you uh, go onto the um, Archer website, if you look under the um, there's a past course materials repository. So uh, if you look for uh, advanced OpenMP courses, you can at least pick up my materials on, on tasking. OK, great. So let's take a break and uh, resume again at, uh, in 20 minutes or so at, uh, at half past the hour with the, uh, with the performance uh, material. OK, great. Speak to you soon. Okay, so this last session is all about performance issues, as promised. Um, so if you're if you're new to OpenMP, and even if you're not, then you know this is only kind of half a joke. Okay, so you know you might end up in this kind of situation. So you wrote your OpenMP program and you checked it gave you the right answers uh, so you ran some timing tests and well the speed up was uh, a bit disappointing really um now what do i do um say most of us probably been there um if you haven't then you probably will experience this as you start writing open mp codes um so the question is you know where did, where did my performance go um, so the way I like to think about it is that it disappeared into overheads of various different sorts. And the way I find it helpful to think about performance problems is uh, to divide up overheads into different types of categories, which, uh, which I call the six, the six and a half evils. So uh, it turns out that there's really six main different types of overhead that you can come that you can encounter in OpenMP programs. Uh, and so here's the list here. So sequential code, idle thread, synchronization, scheduling, communication, and hardware resource contention. Um, so we're going to go through those in each of those in some detail to understand what they are, what causes them, and what the sort of things that you might be looking at to try and fix them. There's another, what so, what about the half? Okay, there's another minor one, which is to do with compiler non-optimization, which I will mention, mention very briefly at the end. It's, uh, it's pretty unusual to come across it, but it's just worth knowing that, it, that, it's a that there is a possibility uh, and to you know, be, be aware that it could happen, um, it's, it's, but it's pretty uncommon these days. Okay, so let's take a look at each of these and, and think about uh, ways, ways of avoiding them. So the first evil is sequential code. So remember that in, in OpenMP, because uh, of this uh, sort of fork join parallel region uh, opening and closing model of parallelism, all the code that's outside parallel regions or probably all the code that's inside master or single directives is sequential code. Um, so it's parts of, the, parts of the application where one thread is executing and all the rest are doing nothing. Um, so you know the time that's spent in this sequential code in the sequential part of the application 
is going to limit performance. That's just a statement of Amdahl's law. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, if if 20% of the original execution time is in code that I don't parallelize, then with the best will in the world, I'm never, you know, no matter how good a job I do of the parallelization, no matter how many threads I use, I'm never going to get more than five times speed up for my application. So if that's what's causing us the problem, well, at least that's relatively straightforward to diagnose. Um, it may be difficult to solve because what that means is that we haven't finished our job. And so we need to look at you know, where, the, you know, where else, apart from the parallel regions, where else is the time being spent and think about ways of parallelizing those. So that's, um, you know, it's easy to understand, may not be easy to fix, um, but at least it, you, know, you can see that it's, uh, this, is, this is a potential source of overhead and it just means that we're going to have to work a bit harder and parallelize some more of the code. Um, so, I mean, op OpenMP is a very, it, this model is really quite convenient because it does allow you to take this, you know, a reasonably incremental approach to parallelization. Because, okay, these are the most, you know, these are the most consuming functions or loops or times uh, or routines in my program. I'm just going to focus on parallelizing those and I can leave the rest of the code sequential and, and that's going to be okay. But what that does mean is that you can easily run into this problem where you, you basically you haven't finished. Okay, number two is idle threads. Okay. So uh, this is you know uh, this so this can also you know you can also get idle threads inside parallel regions because some threads, for example, may finish a piece of computation before others, and they have to wait for for others to catch up. So the most common situation in OpenMP would be at barriers. So you know, threads will sit idle in a barrier at the end of a parallel loop, say, or at the end of a parallel region. Um, so you know, this uh, the illustration here is supposed to be you know look like one of these uh, activity timelines. So you know, it's supposed to show four threads executing, and you know, time running from left to right, and the blue bars are where the threads are doing useful work. And the red sections are where they finished, and they are simply waiting for the for the slowest thread, in which in this case the third thread to catch up. So fixing this uh, type of problem is usually down to avoiding load imbalance. Um, so, you know, if it's a parallel loop, then you can experiment, you know, as we talked about, with the different schedule kinds and chunk sizes uh, and use the, uh, you know, the runtime option uh, to avoid recompilation. So you can you know, set the schedule kind and chunk size using an environment variable and you can you know, run, a, run a lot of experiments without having to recompile your code. Um, for more irregular computations, um, so I haven't talked about OpenMP tasks in, in this course, um, but for you know for very irregular types of computation, using tasks can be helpful um, because in that case the runtime is meant to take care of the load balancing for you. Um, just a warning that you know say it's it's not necessarily always safe to assume that two threads doing the same number of computations or executing the same code uh, will necessarily take the same amount of time um, because this is to do with you know the although the amount of you know the amount of computation may be the same so the, you know both threads may indeed execute the same number of instructions but the time that's taken to load or store data may be different okay? and you know, particularly in a lot of scientific applications, then um, threads will spend most of their time or a majority of their time loading and storing data to memory rather than actually computing things. Um, so, uh, you know, depending if and where the data is cached, 
um, then different threads may experience different load and store times. So that can be a source of load imbalance, even though the threads are executing the same number of instructions. Um, so you can also get idle time, for example, at critical sections. So uh, you know, if, um, so in this case, I've got uh, my timeline here. Uh, the uh, the green stripy bit is supposed to be a a critical section, so where only one thread at a time uh, can can access that piece of code, can execute that piece of code. So um, once the thread has entered it, all the other threads have to wait their turn. So and that that's another source of potential threads being idle. So, you know, in, in OpenMP, critical regions, atomics, or lock routines, if you use any of those as a synchronization mechanism, then you can also uh, run into problems with having idle threads when you have uh, contention for, for these uh, synchronization mechanisms. So what can you do? Uh, well, uh, clearly so you want to minimize the time spent in the critical section. So you can think about, you know, can you reduce the amount of time that's in there, you know, just execute the minimum amount of code in there that's required to update the, you know, to do whatever you're doing with the shared variables and, you know, get other stuff out of there. Can you optimize that code in some way, you know, make that code as efficient as possible? Um, let's say, you know, OpenMP critical regions are effectively a global lock. Um, so, you know, if you can, if you want to, if you have, you know, two, two or more different shared data structures that can be, uh, uh, can be protected in differently, you know, is protected separately, then you can use critical directives with different names. Um, use atomics if possible. Okay, so if it's a pattern, uh, if it's that, the type of, sort of single uh, single statement update that uh, that applies for atomics, then it's almost certainly worth using them. Uh, it allows more optimization, so it allows, as we talked about, it allows concurrent updates to different array elements, for example. Um, but if that's not possible, then maybe using multiple locks is a is a better solution than than a single critical region. Okay, so that brings us on to number three, which is the synchronization itself. Okay, so every time we synchronize threads, there, there's going to be some overhead, even if the threads are never idle. Okay, because you know it's the there has to be some communication mechanism between the threads um, to make the synchronization possible. Um, this is uh, this is done through the memory system, so it's uh, it's basically you know threads uh, doing special kinds of reads reads and writes to memory locations at some level at some some very low level. Um, so this is not for free, um, and uh, uh, many OpenMP codes because of the because you know, OpenMP is built around. Um, parallel regions which have a barrier at the end and parallel loops which have a barrier at the end unless you explicitly suppress it. So that means that you know, you know typical OpenMP codes are full of implicit barriers uh, and these can be quite expensive. So you know, we talked about the overhead of, of uh, parallel regions uh, in the last talk um, and a lot of that overhead is actually down to the barrier synchronization at the end. So, you know, depending on the, the number of threads and the runtime of the hardware, but say, you know, typically you're looking at you know, thousands to tens of thousands of processor clock cycles to, to do a barrier synchronization. Okay. And other types of synchronization, so criticals, atomics, and locks are not free either. Um, and also, that also applies to tasks, which we haven't, haven't really talked about. Okay. So in order to be able to avoid synchronization overheads, um, so um, basically means that you have to try and think about parallelizing at the outermost level possible. So to increase the granularity of the, par the, the parallelization so, so, that you, so that you reduce the frequency of, of barriers. Um, 
So, you know, that may not always be convenient or natural. You know, the way your code is written may mean that your, you know, all your uh, all your parallelism is essentially exposed in lots of in lots of different individual loops. Um, parallelizing those may mean that you have a barrier at the end of each of them, and you know, an individual loop may not actually execute for very long. So, if that's a prop, if that's the problem, then you need to think about making your parallelism more coarse grained. Um, so that might, for example, require reordering of loops, and that, but that in turn might also involve a, a reordering of array indices if you're operating on, on multidimensional arrays. Okay. Um, I mentioned no weight clauses. You can think about using those, but you do, you know, you have to be pretty careful. It's, uh, it's obviously easy to introduce race conditions by removing barriers that are actually required for, for correctness. And again, just to reiterate, so atomics may have, you know, tip may have less overhead than critical or logs. And so most most implementations, this is, and most modern implementations of OpenMP, this is this is genuinely true. Okay. Um, the next evil is scheduling. And so, if our OpenMP program, you know, in any threaded program, if we are creating computational tasks, but we're relying on the runtime to do some assignment of these tasks to threads, um, then we're going to incur some overheads because the process of the over the, the runtime doing this is again not for free, and some of that may actually be down to internal synchronization in the runtime. But it's not just synchronization. It's going to be other bookkeeping code going on in the runtime to uh, to take care of this kind of thing. So this happens where we have uh, non-static loop schedules. So if you have dynamic or guide or possibly auto loop schedules, then you have some uh, overhead incurred for the runtime doing the scheduling of loop iterations to threads. And it also happens with tasks as well. Um, but you, you know, so an example like this, you know, so I've, you know, if, if I have a loop with 10 million iterations, um, so that may execute for a long time, but each each individual iteration doesn't do very much, then using a dynamic schedule with a chunk size of one um, might not work out very well, because in every single iteration there is some overhead occurred with the runtime deciding which uh, which thread is going to execute it. So, so that kind of thing might not work out. Okay, so and in this case, it's really just a question of choosing the right chunk size. But uh, you know, that's uh, that's really what's going on here. That's you know, that's one of the reasons why a, you know a, a small chunk size might not uh, might not work out too well. The general message here is that uh, you need to, if we're doing this kind of dynamic task scheduling style of programming, then it's important to get the granularity of the tasks right. So if we have, um, you know, it, it's a trade-off, uh, maybe in you know, maybe one of these kind of unsolvable trade-off situations, but essentially what happens if we have a small number of big tasks, that may mean that we end up with idle threads because we can't balance the load very well. On the other hand, if we have too many small, very small tasks, we may, you know, that may be uh, sufficient to get good load balancing, but you might incur significant scheduling overheads instead. So there's often going to be some kind of um, sweet spot in terms of the task granularity. And you know, that's something that, you have to think about from an application point of view. It's often not, uh, you know, it's, it's not the sort of thing that the runtime can can readily take care of for itself. Um, it's something you have to think about for, um, you know, in terms of in terms of your your application. So, you know, what's the right level of granularity to split up your split up your work into into these parallel tasks um, to you know, avoid ending up with either with idle threads or or too many scheduling overheads.
Okay. So, so far, these are reasonably um, easy things to think about and reason about. When we come on to the next one, which is communication. It actually gets a lot more difficult. Um, the reason is this is that our, our shared memory systems, which is you know what we're targeting with OpenMP, um, communication is kind of disguised. It, it shows up as increased memory access costs because it takes longer to access data in main memory or data in another processor's cache than it does to to access it in in, in the local cache. You know, I have to remember on you know, so on modern hardware, memory accesses are relatively expensive operations. Um, so you know, think of you know, order of a hundred clock cycles for a main memory access is compared to you know, sort of um, you know, a handful of cycles to do a floating point operation. So in uh, in most shared memory hardware, the communication between processors or between cores place via cache coherency mechanism. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a very brief explanation about what that is in, in, a, in a minute. But the problem is that you know compared to you know, something like a message passing model, the communication is very fine-grained. It's on the level of individual loads and stores. Uh, and it's also spread throughout the program in a way that's not obvious. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so typically, if you, if uh, if any of you are familiar with writing message passing programming in, in programming in MPI, for example, then it's you know it's very obvious exactly where the communication is taking place because you had to code it explicitly. Okay, so all the communication takes place in calls to the MPI library, so you know where to look. In uh, shared memory programs, the communication is appearing uh, in uh, in certain load and store operations. So these are, you know, but you, but it's hard to tell which ones are affected just by looking at the code. So this makes it so it makes it much harder to analyze. It's very difficult to just eyeball a piece of code and saying say to yourself, well, yes, obviously there is some inter-thread communication going going on here at, you know, in the in the um, in the loads of this array element on this line. Okay? So looking at looking at code and, and figuring that out is is pretty difficult. Um, and it's also much harder to monitor. Okay? So in the sense that it's it's really difficult to get tools that will analyze this for you. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about tools at the very at the end. Okay, so cache coherency is um, a feature of hardware. It's quite complicated, but here we are. Uh, you know, a simplified description on one side, which is um, which is what what we need to understand as as programmers as uh, as a basic at a basic level. Okay, so what happens is that you know. If a essentially the way this works is that if a thread writes a data item, it get, what it what happens is that it will get an exclusive copy of that piece of data in its local cache. Okay, and in order to avoid having um, copies that are out of date in other caches. What will happen is that any any other copies of that data item that uh, will get invalidated, so that other uh, other threads running on other cores are prevented from reading uh, out of date data. And then, if uh, if, a, you know, if if there's a subsequent access to that data item by other threads, so either a read or a write then that has to go and retrieve the data from the cache where that exclusive copy now is. Um, and this all takes time because it requires moving data between different caches on different cores in the system. Okay, so yeah, 
that's a very highly simplified description of, of what's going on. Okay. But essentially what that what that means is that if we have, you know, if we have different threads accessing data items, then there has to be some way of transferring those values between threads running on different cores. And again, that's not for free. So what can we do about this? Well, really, when we're writing uh, OpenMP programs, we have to think about data affinity. What do I mean by that? Well, data is going to get cached on processes which are accessing it. OK, that's what caches do. Um, so it's important to reuse cached data as much as possible. So of course, this is also important for the performance of sequential programs. Okay, but there's, there's, there's this kind of extra dimension to it when we come to multi programs, uh, in the sense that you know, not only do we want to, re to reuse cache data as much as possible, but we want to make sure that it's the same thread that's, that's, re that's doing the reuse. So, what do I mean by writing code with good data affinity? That means essentially ensuring that the same thread is going to access the same subset of your program data as much as possible. Okay. Uh, and it's also generally important to try and make these subsets large, reasonably large contiguous chunks of data. Okay, so not just you know it's it's uh, it may not be sufficient for reasons which I'll come on to in a minute to to make sure to uh, ensure that it's just uh, just having threads accessing different words of data may not be enough. As an aside, it's also important to prevent threads migrating between cores while the code is running. Because what will happen is, so if a thread switches from running on one core to another core, it will have left all its cached data behind. Okay, So, you know, the, the act of moving a thread does not automatically or, f or freely move the data that was in the cache on the core where it used to be running. So now the, where the thread is now running on a new core, then all that, all that data that it was recently used is now somewhere else uh, and has to follow it. And, and that's not for free. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why uh, having threads migrating between cores is not a good idea for performance. As I mentioned in the last task, we can use um, in general, we can use the environment variable OMP proc bind equals true to do this. If you're running on uh, high performance systems, then this may be taken care of for you by batch system. So, but it depends. Okay, it depends on the way your batch system has been set up as to whether it does binding of threads to to cores or not. Um, so you may need to figure out whether that's actually actually happening as, as a result of your batch jobs or, or not. Okay, so here's an attempt to, to illustrate an example here. Um, okay, um, so this is a little bit tricky to do online without sort of waving my hands around and, and, and talking about access patterns, but I'll try anyway. Okay, so what we've got here is, okay, two parallel loops. Okay, so and you'll see is that the first loop writes some values into an array, okay, a two-dimensional array A here. And then sometime later in the code, we have a second loop which reads values out of that same array. Okay. Now you see that in the first loop, uh, J runs from zero to, to N. So every, that, what that means is that this is a well-balanced loop. Every I iteration has the same amount of work to do. So there's no reason uh, a priori to, to use anything other than a static schedule here. In contrast, the second, in the second loop, you'll see that the J loop runs from zero up to I here. Okay. 
So that means that indeed different I iterations do have different amounts of work. So this is not a well-balanced loop. And therefore, you may choose on, on that basis to use uh, you know, a different schedule. So in this case, I've chosen to use static schedule with a, with a chunk size of 16, you know, for example. But what does that mean? OK, so that means that the assignment of I values to threads is going to be different for these two different loops. Okay. This is basically a block scheduled loop. This will be a block cyclic scheduled loop with a chunk size of 16. So the assignment uh, of I values to threads is going to be different. So what that means is that the accesses to this array A are going to be different for these two different loops. Okay. So the th typically what, you know, in, in general, the thread that reads the value of A in this loop is not the same thread that wrote it in the first loop. So that means that if you know if the first loop causes values of this array to get cached, um, then almost in almost all cases, then the read down here will have to access a value that's in some other in the cache on some other core. So a pattern like this, because we've got different patterns of accesses. Uh, you know, based on the thread number to to these uh, to this array, then you will end up with additional communication. So this one's not too difficult to fix. Okay, so if I if I basically copied the schedule, so if I used uh, the same static 16 schedule on both loops, then I would you know I, I might occur a little bit a little bit of additional overhead for the first loop, but it'll still be balanced uh, and I will get much better data affinity because I'll make sure that the same threads are accessing AJI in the first loop as they are in the second loop. Okay. And here's another pattern, same kind of idea, but a, uh, but a different example. Uh, okay, suppose I have a parallel loop that reads values in an array A. Uh, and then I have a sequential loop which reassigns the values, which writes values into A. Uh, and then another parallel loop or maybe just another instance of the same parallel loop that, that reads it again. Okay. And, you know, the initial analysis of our code may suggest that, you know, this loop in the middle here doesn't take significant amount of time uh, and therefore it's not worth parallelizing. But we've now ended up with a situ another situation where our data affinity isn't good. Okay, Because what will happen here is that the accesses uh, in this loop will cause copies of A, of the elements of A to be spread across different multiple caches where the different threads in this parallel loop are running. Then uh, the sequential accesses, so these are right accesses, so this will cause exclusive copies to be created into the cache where the master thread is running and all the other copies will be invalidated. So when we come to run the parallel loop again, then the uh, the accesses to A here all have to go to the cache where the master thread was executing to, to retrieve the new values again. So again, uh, fixes to this. So yes, you might describe, okay, um, either, so parallelizing this middle loop might work. Um, probably better would be to try and fold these loops together. Okay, so that you are, and that will that will that would probably also improve the sequential performance as well, so that you get some immediate reuse between the the resets and the and the reads. So uh, a number of different possible tactics for for improving the the data affinity for this case too. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, the you know what you will observe is that the. Uh, you'll observe a rather unusual effect 
that this the sequential loop in the middle here what will, what you might what you might well see is that that sequential loop takes longer when you have multiple threads executing than it does on one thread yeah, which at first sight looks a bit weird right so it's just the same sequential code it's still executing on one thread but the data access patterns have changed so the cache behavior has changed so uh, and because it now has to do uh, uh, cross cache invalidations then the sequential code will actually take longer when I have multiple threads in the parallel regions than if I only had one. And you'll also find that you know, probably if you look at the scalability of the second parallel region, that's not going to scale well because of the additional cache misses that happen if you have multiple threads. So what does this mean? Well, this is another case where you may need to end up parallelizing code which doesn't necessarily appear to take much time in the, in the sequential program. So this brings us on to some worse, uh, you know, as if this isn't bad enough, there are some worse things that can happen. Okay. Uh, so the first of these is uh, so-called NUMA effects. Um, so NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. Okay. Um, so this is because this is the, the way that uh, systems are designed if you have more than one chip in a shared memory system. Okay, so it's often called multi, you know, often referred to as, as multi socket systems. Because in systems like this, then the location of data in main memory becomes important. Because the, uh, if you remember back to the very first, uh, very first talk talking about the hardware, then our main, if we have a multi socket system, then main memory is actually physically split across the different sockets so you know and this applies to all you know all, all multi-socket x86 teams these these days are built, are built like this okay and what you have in a, in particular what you'll find if you uh, if you look at hp current hpc systems almost all current hpc systems have two sockets per node and with supporting shared memory across both sockets across the whole node so you get this problem in uh, in nodes of, or of of typical clusters that you'll find around at the moment so openmp doesn't offer you any support for controlling the location of data in main memory and the uh, so this is this is basically down to the operating system and the common default policy is for the operating system to place data on the processor or basically on the socket which first accesses it so this is so-called first touch policy okay? so the first time in your program uh, where a piece of data is actually accessed okay so not where it's declared but where it's actually actually first written to, then uh, that at that point the operating system says, okay, this access, this first access to this data came from a core on this kit, so it will place that page of data on the memory attached to that socket. So for um, Sequential processes for sequential applications that makes perfect sense for um, MPI applications that also because you know every MPI uh, every MPI rank is a separate process um, this also makes a whole lot of sense because you know every MPI process can only access its own data so that also makes a whole lot of sense that's good. Unfortunately, for OpenMP programs, this could be the worst possible option, because uh, you know typically what what happens is that you didn't parallelize your data initialization, okay? because it doesn't take a significant amount of time compared with the with executing the whole all the rest of your application. So what will happen is if your data is all initialized in the master thread, that data will all get 
allocated on one of on one of the NUMA nodes on one of the sockets. Okay, and then what happens is that you end up with a memory bottleneck. So having all the threads running across both sockets, all trying to access where all their data is on one of the sockets, then you end up with you end up artificially constraining the amount of bandwidth, memory bandwidth that you that your application has available. So how do you avoid this? Um, okay, so in some operating systems, there are options to control your data placement. So for example, in Linux, you can use the NUMA CTL command to change the policy from first touch to, to round robin. So it'll just alternate allocating pages between your two different sockets. Another option is that you can try to use the first touch policy uh, to control your data placement indirectly by actually parallelizing your data initialization. Okay. So even though that might not seem worthwhile in terms of the amount of time it takes, it might be very, very worthwhile in terms of getting that, the, uh, the data placement right for, for the rest of the, well, the application. And typically, you don't have to worry too much about getting it exactly right, OK? Um, and in fact, in many applications, there may not be an obviously right distribution of data um, between, your, between your different bits of main memory. But the important thing is to get some distribution. It's, you know, it's better than none at all. You want to avoid this pathological case where all your data is allocated on one socket. Um, so that may, but this may or may not be straightforward. Okay, it depends on your the data structures in your application. If you're dealing with large multi-dimensional arrays, um, which are basically allocated once at the start of your application and and that's it, then this may be a pretty trivial thing to do. Um, if you have you know much more complicated data structures, you know, so you have um, you know graph-like data structures or tree-like data structures which are you know which are constructed um, uh, by you know piece piece by piece and or you know dynamically allocated and deallocated at various different places throughout your program then this can be much harder or in fact impossible to do so it depends very much on the on the data structures in your application um, and just remember that this allocation is being done on an operating system page basis. So you have to figure out, you know, roughly what size your pages are in your system. So, you know, by default, in uh, they're usually some, you know, sort of a few kilobytes. Um, um, but this is a reason. This might be a reason not to use large page options. Okay. So that's bad. So numa effects are, uh, are nasty. Um, so another another really nasty thing is uh, is false sharing. Though, to be fair, mod, uh, advances in modern processes um, have done a reasonable amount to reduce the impact of this, um, but it's nevertheless still still visible. The problem here is that so we talked about how threads communicate via the cache coherency mechanism. The, the problem here is that the units of data on which this, this mechanism operates is essentially cache lines. And these are typically um, something like, six, you know, depends on the hardware, but they are typically something like 64, 128 bytes. Uh, and that means that they're bigger than a word, okay? So your, you know, your words, your integers, or floating point values are typically four or eight bytes long. Um, so the problem happens is you have, if you have different threads writing to neighboring words in memory, that might still cause cache invalidations. Okay? So logically, you've got no communication going on in your program because the threads are not actually sharing any words of the data. So there's you know, no race conditions, there's no communication, but nevertheless, if threads happen to be writing to neighboring words in memory, um, it still may trigger the, the cache coherency and validation mechanisms. 
and it's still a problem even if you just have one thread writing and the others reading then you will still get invalidations happening and, and, uh, and it's the same problem okay so the worst cases will happen where you have different threads repeatedly writing neighboring array elements okay so this is the kind of pattern you want to think about trying to avoid so you know one case would be okay so if you uh, if you declare an array and you index that array by the thread id and you're doing lots of reads and writes to this thing so maybe you have you know maybe you have an array where you're counting some events and every thread is doing its own count into a different array element then this will trigger this kind of problem so every write will will invalidate all the values that happen to be uh, all the neighboring all the values that really belong to neighboring threads that happen to lie in the same cache block cache line and you can also run into this problem with, you know, so again, if you have uh, so the second example down here, okay. So this is another one of these triangular uh, um, loops. Oh, no, it isn't. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, okay. Yeah, I suppose it would be better if, uh, it would make more sense if I had a triangular loop here, if I had uh, j, uh, j equals zero, j less than i here. So I had one of these unbalanced loops. So I wanted to choose a, you know, a, a, a non-default schedule here. But if I choose static one here, what does that mean? It means that, you know, neighboring values, so consecutive values of I will be executed by different threads. Uh, and that implies that different threads are going to be reading and writing neighboring values in, in this array B here. Um, so again, this is the same problem. Okay, so I ha I'm going to end up with different threads writing neighboring words in memory. Um, will will also potentially trigger problem. Okay, so communication can be quite tricky, and it's hard to hard to recognise what's going on. Um, another problem is, and so this is the last of my, my main categories here, is hardware resource contention. Um, so, you know, the design of hardware is a, is, is a trade-off, okay? And basically, there are, you know, the way that hardware is designed, there are, there are some shared resources, which if all the cores try to access them at the same time, don't scale. So... Or, you know, put it another way, you know, think of it as, as a sort of, you know, half, glass half empty versus glass, glass half full argument. And, um, you know, another, an application which runs on a single, sorry, that should say single core, not single code. Um, so an application running on a single core can access more than its fair share of the resources. Okay. So in particular, cores and therefore the threads which are running on them can contend for uh, memory bandwidth. Um, and also for cache capacity, and also potentially for functional units like floating point units if we are if we're using simultaneous multi-threading or, or, or hyper-threading. So if we're using hardware threads, then threads can contend for the uh, functional units on the processor as well. But the worst problems are typically with memory bandwidth. Okay? So codes which are very bandwidth hungry will typically not scale linearly on most shared memory hardware. Uh, and you know, this is true of quite a lot of typical scientific applications are, are often really uh, memory bandwidth constrained. So you just you just because of the hardware, you, is, you know, it's really nothing to do with with the with the efficiency of OpenMP. It's uh, it's really a, a hardware effect that you won't get good scalability. And it's quite hard to deal with this, okay? You just have to try and reduce the bandwidth demands by improving the locality of data in your, in your application and trying to, uh, try to improve the reuse of data in caches. Um, so that's probably gonna benefit the sequential performance as well. So, you know, it's, uh, it's generally a good thing, but it's, uh, it's often quite difficult to achieve without some fairly major restructuring of the, of the uh, memory access patterns in your application. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, try not to to uh, present you with too many graphs or data in this in, in uh, to look at, but uh, and this this one I think is is uh, really uh, quite instructive and, and a ni nice example. So, okay. Um, so why I did so I took one of the uh, one of the one of the nodes on on Archer, which happens to be an Intel. It's a bit of an old processor these days, but uh, that doesn't really matter. So it's an Intel Ivy Bridge processor. It has 12 cores. Each core has its own level one and level two caches, uh, and then there's a 30 megabyte shared L3 cache between all the cores. So what I did was so I took this uh, this parallel loop here um, so it basically doesn't matter that it has a reduction in it um, all that really matters is that it's doing it is that this loop is reading values from an array okay so it's just doing straightforward accesses to an array here okay. so what you do is okay let's run this loop for different values of n okay and I'm going to repeat the execution often enough so that I will get the benefit. So if I, you know, if, if the values of A will fit in some level of cache, then I will get the benefit of reusing them by repeating the execution of this, this parallel loop. Okay. So run this for different, for lots of different values of N um, from very small to very large and ask the question, okay, so for different numbers of threads, how much speed up will I get from, from, from executing this loop in parallel? Okay, uh, and that's what's shown on, uh, on this slide here. Okay, so what, what, what I'm illustrating here is, so on the y-axis I have the speed up gained, and I'm plotting that against the number of iterations in the loop. Okay, so I start off at very small values, just a few hundred, and running up to a hundred million or so iterations at the end here. So what you'll immediately see is that, okay, and so the different lines represent different numbers of threads. Okay, so blue is two threads, red is three threads, green is six threads, and purple is 12 threads. So what you will see immediately is that for small number, if there aren't very many iterations in the loop, so down at the left, the, the bottom left-hand side here is, then the speed up, speed up that I get is actually much, much less than one. So what that means is that the parallel code is running much slower than the code on one thread. What's going on here? Well, this is, this is death by synchronization, okay? This is the problem that there isn't enough work inside the parallel loop to overcome the overheads of the parallel region. And so because they, you know, the compiler does a pretty good job of optimizing this loop, it vectorizes it and so on, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very efficient. Um, in, it turns out that you need, so, you know, I need of the order of kind of, you know, tens of thousands of iterations in that loop just to break even. Okay. So I need to have enough work in the loop to make it worth parallelizing. Okay. So provided I do that, then for two threads, okay, everything is pretty much, uh, it behaves like you'd expect. Okay, so by the time I've got in, if I, the loop's big enough, then I will always get more or less a two times speed up on two threads, which is nice. Okay. When I go to three threads, um, I see something is slightly odd going on. So there's this region here in the middle, there's this little hump here where I can actually achieve more than three times speed up on three threads. So how does that happen? Well, that happens when uh, the array will fit into the, the three caches running on where the on the cores where three different threads are running, but it won't fit into the cache. And in this case, it's the is the L2 cache that, that matters here, the level two cache. So at this point here, the data doesn't fit into the L 
into the L2 cache of one core, but if I spread it, spread the data across three cores using three threads, then it does fit. So I get better performance per, uh, per core here. But then you'll see, for, uh, as, as I increase the size of the data, uh, it doesn't fit into the, cache, into, the, into the L2 cache anymore, and I end up with something with a bit less than, than three times speed up. With six threads, I also get this, uh, this hump. It just about reaches six times speed up, but then it settles down to a region where I see about four and a half times speed up. So this is where the data fits into the level three cache. So I now have enough threads running that I'm, saturate, uh, I'm pretty much saturating the, the level three cache bandwidth. I can't get any more uh, that, it, you know, that it doesn't scale very well. Um, well, maybe I'm not saturating it, but I'm not getting the scalability that I'm that I'm that I'm that I'm looking for here. Okay, so I don't get six times speed up in this region here. And then when it's big enough, uh, when I'm when I run out, when it's big enough at this point, the array is too big to fit in the level three cache. So then all the accesses are coming from main memory, and then I'm contending for for main memory bandwidth, and I get I get less than four times speed up. And then for 12 threads, so I do better when it when uh, fitting the level three cache, but I'm still getting some content here. And then again, when I'm, as soon as I, as soon as the data doesn't fit into that 30 megabytes of L3, then I'm restricted. Even with 12 threads, I can't get more than four times speed up because of the contention for for memory bandwidth. So I've got. 12 threads running on 12 different cores, all hammering away at the memory bandwidth. And, and it, that, that, that just becomes a bottleneck for the application. So you can also contend for cache space. So if you have systems like this, so you know, all, a lot of current processors have these uh, shared L3 caches. So uh, you may, you know, I, they may not, your codes don't appear not to scale very well because if you run a, if you run a single thread, a single core can have access to the whole of that cache. Whereas when, so when you increase the number of threads, then the space in that cache gets successively divided and divided into smaller pieces um, available for each thread. Okay. And then if we're using hardware threads, okay, so what Intel calls hyper-threading or more generally, more generally uh, simultaneous multi-threading. Um, if you have threads, so threads running on the same core will contend for your functional units as well. So this is part of the reason why you know, a lot of scientific applications don't actually benefit from using these hardware threads. And a lot of HPC systems have this feature disabled by default for that reason. Um, so, you know, codes which are very bandwidth hungry or which, you know, saturate your floating point units like so dense linear algebra um, may actually run slower if you, you try to utilize the hardware threads. So another way you can contend for hardware resources is by oversubscription. So this is basically the idea if you run more threads than you have hardware execution units, so cores or hardware threads, that's generally a bad idea. Because what happens here is that the, uh, the operating system tries to give each thread a fair share of those execution units. So it will be constantly stopping one thread running and allowing another thread to run in its place. And the cost of stopping one thread and starting another is is high. Uh, you know, it's, it, the operating system has to get involved and do do a bunch of do a whole bunch of stuff to make this happen. And um, that's you know thousands of clock cycles to do a, to do a thread switch. Uh, besides which, it ruins your data locality. Okay, so because you now lose control over where threads are running, so um, you know, every time you every time you swap a thread in and out, you lose you know you lose its cached data and so on. Okay, so I promised the sixth and a half problem, which is compiler non-optimization. It's very rare these days, but just occasionally. Adding OpenMP directives can interact badly with the rest of the compiler's optimizations. 
Um, so what you're, the symptoms you will see here is that if you uh, compile your code with OpenMP and run it on one thread, then it will have a longer execution time than just compiling the code without an open M without OpenMP. Um, so it's very bad luck if that happens to you. It's pretty uncommon, but if it does happen, it's a, it's a nuisance because it can be really hard to find a find a work find out what the problem is or or what the uh, what a suitable workaround is. Okay. So. Okay, a strategy for you. Okay. So, you know, this is, that's a lot to take in. And you know, so what does that mean when I'm actually working with real code? Okay, so, so you know, you're in the situation where your code isn't giving you good speed up and you don't know why. So, you know, what do you do now? Well, okay, yes. So I, I hope that I've tried to convince you that uh, not to take option one, which is just to give up and say, oh, op open MP is rubbish, okay? Um, and why, uh, why did I ever bother trying to use it in the first place? If you want to make progress, and I think you, you know, I encourage you to try and do is you, you need to try and classify the lo and localize the sources of overheads. Okay, so you need to try and identify you know, what type of problem is it, you know, which one of those six overhead categories is causing the problem, and whereabouts in the code does it occur. So if you can figure that out, then you have a fighting chance of changing the code and optimizing it and fixing your performance problem. Okay? So if you don't know that, then you're basically just shooting in the dark. Um, use tools to help you. Um, timers are very helpful. Possibly hardware counters. Um, possibly profiling tools. I'll say a little bit more about them in a minute. And then clearly, you know, it, it's the same deal as, as optimizing sequential code, you know, fix the problems which are responsible for the largest overheads first. Okay, so fix the, you know, there's no point fixing the small problems if you've still got a big problem left. Um, and then you know, once you fix one problem, you know, measure again, see how you're doing uh, and try and move on, maybe try and move on to the next one. So a little bit about profiling. So you know, profiling is you know, whenever you're doing code optimization, then profiling is really important. You know, it's absolutely crucial to understand. If you want to understand the performance of your application, you absolutely have to understand where it's spending its time. Um, unfortunately, for OpenMP code standard profilers, you know, so things like GProf or what you get in your IDE can be pretty confusing because what they tell you is the accumulated time spent in functions across all threads. So that's, that's okay, but it's not very helpful and doesn't tell you the whole story. Okay? It doesn't, you know, it, for example, it doesn't help you identify where load, where, where load imbalance is happening because it doesn't point out any differences between the time spent in a function uh, across different threads. Um, you know, some tools may do a better job. They may, you know, they, you may get a, uh, instead of just getting the accumulated time, you might get a, you know, you might, it might tell you the, you know, the maximum, the minimum, and the average across threads. So some tools, some tools are better, better than others. Um, you can get a lot out of using timers, and I probably encourage you to do this. Um, so, you know, basically what you can do is if you, if you add timers around every parallel region in your code and also around the whole code, or at least, you know, the, uh, the, the bits that you're interested in, maybe, you know, ex excluding some initialization. Um, and then, so if you do that, then you can at least do the localization bit. You can work out, you know, you can compute the speed up on a per parallel region basis, and you can work out which parallel regions Aren't, aren't giving you good speed up. Um, and also you say, you know, don't assume that the time spent out, you know, outside the parallel regions is independent. But if you do this, okay, so, you know, if you know the time for the whole code, you know the time for every parallel region, you know, by subtraction, you can tell how much time your code is, uh, is spending outside parallel regions. So that also tells you about the, the first category, the sequential code category of, uh, uh, of overheads.
depending on what system you're working on, you may or may not have access to some performance tools. Um, there are something of a mixed blessing if you're if you are uh, if you can invest enough time in a particular tool to learn how to use it, learn how to how to use it uh, to to its full capabilities, then they can be helpful. Um, but uh, they can also be difficult to use, fragile, confusing, and inaccurate. So you know they are they are a bit of a mixed bag. Um, there's a bunch here that you might come across. Um, I don't think the Oracle one exists anymore. Um, so Intel VTune is quite a common one on on Intel systems. Um, you know, particularly if you're if you've got if we're working with Intel compilers, Craypat on Cray systems. Scalaska is quite an interesting tool. Uh, it's free, so you can download and install it. And it does at least try to do this um, idea. It tries to follow this kind of idea of breaking down overheads into different categories. Um, but um, but uh, none of those first first set of tools um, were really are really able to tell you anything very much about communication or hardware resource contention. Um, there is one tool which is called ParaTools Thread Spotter, which is actually which works in a very different way. Um, it's kind of a it does something a bit like the race detection tools in the sense that it um, that it does it does a pro, uh, an instrumented execution uh, and then dumps a trace, but it doesn't have to dump a it just does a statistical um, sample of memory accesses. It doesn't have to, it's not like a race detection tool which has to has to dump every single access. So it does a sampled uh, dump of your memory accesses and then basically what it does is replays that through a hardware simulator uh, and by doing that it's able to tell you things like you know uh, where you where you have communication where you have false sharing whether you have bandwidth you know where you have bandwidth contention in your code so that that's quite an interesting tool that tells you stuff about the the cache and memory problems which the other tools really can't do Okay, so I'm sorry that I've uh, overrun my time slot a bit there, um, but I, I hope that was that was useful, and I will now be able to see if we have any questions. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, then I'll just wrap up by saying thank you very much for sticking it out to the end. I uh, I hope you uh, um, hope hope that was useful. Um, please give us uh, you know please take a moment or two to uh, fill in the feedback form on the link that Claire will send send out. Um, always keen to know uh, what we can do to to improve our courses. Um, so well, thank you very much. <laughs>